Welcome, this is Mabbit Marketing and I am your host, Rachel Claver. I love helping small business owners become more confident and more capable with their marketing. So this podcast is all here to help you do just that. It's me and the help of some great guests helping you learn new skills, new strategies and ideas. Let's jump in and get started. Welcome to episode 63 of Map It Marketing. I'm your host, Rachel Claver, and today is a topic that strikes a little bit personally for me because I have a brain that is not typical. I interrupt people, I overshare, I sometimes have days where I can get as much work done as someone might take a whole week to do, and then I might the next day not be able to do anything at all. I have a a neurodivergent brain. And our guest today, Vanessa Victor, has a saying. She says, once you've met a neurodivergent person, you've met just a neurodivergent person. And what that means is is the way that a neurodivergent brain works will present itself different in everyone, which can make things a little bit confusing. With between 30 to 40% of the population considered to be likely neurodiverse, and the fact that a neurodivergent person is more statistically likely to own their own business, there's a lot of us running around out there in small business land. You might be one too. I know that my brain really struggles with normal basic tasks, but I can also get a huge amount of work done if I'm having a great day. And this up and down nature of my output and my focus used to be a really huge source of great anxiety, along with my knack of oversharing, my oversensitive nature and my anxiety and all sorts of new types of social interactions. It's been great. All of this has a large impact as me as me on a business owner, and I know I'm not alone. So I'm really thankful that I met Vanessa. I got to work with her earlier this year on her marketing strategy, and her and her co-owner, Becky, are both fabulous people. Vanessa herself is dyslexic and has ADHD, and also happens to teach organizations and businesses how to make most of their neurodiverse team members. She is a complete expert in this area. She also helps those same members learn skills to help them thrive in a neurotypical world. She's also a small business owner, and she knows firsthand the traps and issues that can crop up for us in our businesses. She's going to be sharing both what she's learned and what she knows as an expert in today's podcast. Vanessa is one of the owners of Remarkable Minds. They provide solutions, tools, and life-changing programs. They coach individuals and businesses with a range of solutions to enable anyone with neurodiversity to feel empowered, confident, and capable, which all sounds very good to me. So without further ado, let's get started talking to Vanessa. Hi, and welcome to episode 63 of the Map Marketing Podcast. I've already done an introduction to you, but I did forget in there to remind you that you can come and be part of the Map Marketing Facebook group and ask any marketing questions in there. And also, I'm going to do a little cheeky pitch for my book, uh, Be a Spider Builder Web. If you want to know how to do content marketing and do it in a real and relevant way, it's a great book to kind of walk through that. Plus, it has all the trials and tribulations of me as a business owner, some of which I've alluded to um, in the introduction when I was introducing Vanessa. But without further ado, I'm so excited to have Vanessa as part of today's podcast and I've already told you how awesome she is in the introduction but I guess one of the things I'm most excited about is she and I have some some differences some big differences but also a few similarities in the way that our brains work so I'm just going to say for everyone here that's a linear person who's listening today and loves everything being in a beautiful ordered thing where people talk very slowly we may disappoint you today, but you will have fun. And I think that's important. Would you say the same, Vanessa? Absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. You know, you know how sometimes you can speed people up? Maybe they need an ADHD slow people down because yeah. Well, I'm just um, about to start recording my audio book. Um, I'm gonna try and try and get some of it done in the next few days. And my biggest worry is I'm just gonna have to have this little tape in the back of my head going speak slowly because even my slow speed is fast yeah yeah yeah, okay. yeah right so let's just find out a bit more about you um Vanessa so it's Vanessa Victor and you own Remarkable Minds or co-own Remarkable Minds yes um and I've said already you know you are an expert in neurodivergent brains um but you've got a neurodivergent brain too right I do I do yeah, I do what makes your neurodivergent brain what's the mix that's going on in that head 
Oh gosh, so I think um, that's actually a really good point to talk about, Rachel, is so what I would like to say is, you know, I take the view and uh, so do we in Remarkable Minds that we are all individuals. So if you've met one person with ADHD, you've met one person with ADHD. And as you've said, you and I are similar, we're female business entrepreneurs, we're probably around about the same age. We'll have some things that fit in the same category and some that don't. So my brain is very complex and I would say there's lots of overlapping and I'm going to slow my talking now no you're now. perfect you can go there's, um, there's lots of over <laughs> overlaps between yeah. these different conditions and what I would say is when you get a diagnosis or you go to see someone more in the medical field they will like check box you mm. okay you're in this camp I don't look at it like that I say our brains are too complex so we've all got a little bit of everything and some of them will be your strengths and some of them will be your weaknesses. So what I'm saying is I'm dyslexic, but I can spell and read really well. In fact, I'm the best speller in the family. So that is mind blowing to me because until yeah. you said that, I just made an assumption that you had, because I knew you had dyslexia. Mm. I made an assumption that meant that you would have issues with that. Yeah, no, not at all. Um, and like I said, you know, um, my um, husband, who's a very left brain linear thinker, you know, keeps saying, how do I spell this word? And so I didn't actually realize I was dyslexic until I was in my 40s. Wow. And then I discovered I'm also a bit ADHD. So my ADHD stuff comes out with time management, prioritizing, you know, um, trying not to have a thousand ideas a day and then, you know, run after them. <laughs> yeah. Do you know that feeling? So I think like, I'll just, we'll get, I want to talk to you about your expertise in a minute too, but that one there, like, I feel like I've got a really good control of that now, but it comes with heartbreak. Mm -hmm. because what I have to do is all those things are on my fun shelf like I have in my head like I've got this little brain space in my head which is called the fun shelf yeah and what I've done is I've managed to hijack my brain somehow and go you get to do those things once you've done all the stuff that's not on the fun shelf so they sit there yeah but then I'm just and all I'm wanting to do is go and pick one yeah. of them off there you know and I I know they're there like I can see them yeah you know, they're going Rachel, on break. Yeah, yeah, they're going, Come on, we're so much more <laughs> fun than the actual work you're doing right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and I think you know, you've hit on something there is it's actually exhausting trying to contain our enthusiasm and our energy and our excitement and our ideas. It's actually exhausting trying not to do that. And yeah, so it you is. know, I and, and it's that whole you're too much right like yeah. you accidentally become too much all the time yeah. because yeah. You, because you just have this joy of excitement of all the new things we're like permanent I don't like calling myself a toddler but we're kind of like a toddler yeah. on Christmas day right it's like yeah. every day is Christmas day with unwrapping potential awesome gifts Ab absolutely and it's so interesting because um you know, once I learned about my own neurodiverse brain, and for me, I don't like the word neurodivergent. I don't know what it is about it, okay, but I don't like it. So I use the word neurodiverse, and what I would say is that is not the technical term, mm. but it is a widely accepted term. So I'm just going to say that. Is that because you do, like, you know, we talked about the thing of not, not every neurodivergent person is going to be the same as anyone else. Is that because you go diverse actually shows me and reminds me that everyone is different divergent mm. actually feels like we have diverted off the normal path which seems a little bit insulting exactly got it exactly and you know what I would say is if you look it's attention deficit disorder yeah yes. it's all it's very negative based all of the diagnoses are very negative and I think mm. as a society that's what we need to do we're not all superheroes. We're not all Richard Branson. We're not all Albert Einstein. And I think that just puts pressure on us as well. Like, oh, you're ADHD. Oh, you're going to be the most successful entrepreneur there ever is. It's a, just about saying, these are the strengths that I have. And, but these are the areas where I know my weaknesses are. And I think for me, finding out why I can never get somewhere on time why I used to take the kids to dress up day and get it the wrong week you know I am that mother 
who's driven into the school grounds and thought, why isn't anybody else in their costume today? You know, and then it's like, lie down on the back seat. We're just going to go home. <laughs> you know, I, I also adore this because I, my kids very, never, never want to have Mufti Day on Mufti Day. And I'm sure there must be a little bit in them that goes, it's because actually innately, I do not trust my mother. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You know, I just, you know, and I'll be like, it's definitely on. Mm, I don't know. We've been burnt by you a few too many times. We're just not yeah, going to do it. Yeah, exactly. And so I think for me, the biggest um, difficulty I had in my life was like you. I was exciting and, you know, people would describe me as vivacious and bubbly, but That's chaotic familiar. and disor disorganized. Yep, also yeah. sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> very disorganized and you know I I ran a business um uh, you know now I look back I've run a couple of different businesses I used to live overseas so I ran some businesses overseas um but I never felt um successful and the reason I didn't feel successful was because I am really excitable and people around me would kind of roll their eyes I'd go oh oh, oh I've had an idea and they'd be like oh no here we go <laughs> you know um and I used to think that was because there was something wrong with me. And I think the biggest gift, actually, that the work I'm doing now is allowed me to accept my strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. So I'm not Richard Branson, but I have these amazing ideas and I can see things in the future and I can see how they'll work out. And that's really good. Mm -hmm. The other side of that is, like we talked about, I find it really hard to focus on the three things that I need to be doing right now because it's boring. Yeah. I want to be off in you know exciting land yeah you know and I think too and I and, and I want I want to talk a little bit about your work that you do with big organizations Turner and we'll talk about that in a minute because I think it's uh -huh. really important but one of the things that I have learned with this too is I remember a really dear friend who's been friends for a long time I was watching someone do a performance and I said to him how do I get to be one of those people and he said and I was very offended by this you have to learn to walk before you run. Yeah. And I feel like with me, my brain is always in run gear mm -hmm. and it's always can see the end result, but I don't necessarily want to have to work out all the revolting little bits to get there. Yeah. And I've had to learn to see that those are stepping stones to get to the yeah. end result. And what but I'd I like to say- I know. Is that kind of like what you mean? Ab absolutely. But, yeah. Absolutely. And what I would say is there's actually a reason for that. So um, anybody who's neurodivergent or neurodiverse is predominantly a right hemisphere thinker. Okay, so we predominantly use the right hemisphere of our brain. That's intuitive, musical, creative, and visual. So our thoughts are running at around 32 images a second. Wow. Okay? So that's wow. how fast we're going. A more traditional linear thinker who is more left hemisphere, word thinking is get this, five words a second. That's a huge change. So that's, that is exactly what you're talking about, running before you walk. So our brains naturally, when we're thinking visually or in kind of kinesthetically, it's like this. Mm -hmm. And we start making all of these connections. Yes, and that's Absolutely. why we struggle with these linear, like step by step. No, you have to do this first, then you've got to do that. Mm. Um, and that's why it feels so slow for us. So our brains are working around six times faster. Because it is interesting, because I know you've got the amazing Becky and your team and you guys work <laughs> together and, and she's yeah. kind of like my husband Rod and my and our business. And we have, um, we have a regular meeting together where we talk about stuff and plan things. And I have had to learn because I would get frustrated that Rod could not think as fast as me. Yeah. And so he'd start mapping something out and he'd start writing on the, on the whiteboard. I'd be go, well, the answer to that thing is here. Yeah. And he'd be like, no, we're going through this process. And I'm like, don't do the process. The answer is here. Yeah. Um, and I've actually had to learn the gift that he is to me and slow me down. Because sometimes, even though I can think really fast and see the end result, I've missed a really important step to get us there and he's going to work it out for me. Exactly, Ex exactly. And I think, you know, that's where that sense of, oh my God, you know, why can't I do this? Like, this is simple. What's wrong mm. with me? Because that's what I used to think, yeah? yeah? Because I think that's what so many people with neurodiversity have is we have, you know, it's kind of like this. 
Yes. You know, I couldn't get my kids to school on time, but I could create this new business. Yes. Like, yes. Now, now, what does the world value while getting to kids? Uh, you yeah. Know, see, there you go. There's my dyslexia. My brain's yes. going too fast. <laughs> There's like your a verbal dyslexia because your brain's going too fast and your mouth can't keep up. Yep. Ah, so interesting. So, yeah, and and that's true whether you're dyslexic, ADHD, you know, any of the neurodiversities. That is what is happening. We can't convey our thoughts into words in a sequential coherent way mm. so that's actually what happens but uh, you know I'm, I'm really glad you brought Rod up and how you've had to learn there's value in both sides yes yeah there's value and in both sides there's value in both sides and I think you know the the great thing about Becky who who is my business partner you know so I started this company but I could quickly see I couldn't make it without someone you know mm. like I and I guess that's what I learned I learned what my strengths are and what my weaknesses are and I'm Becky and I are a great team like that um, mm. because she is the she's got the saying that's a really good idea you know yes Rod says that too that's a really good idea <laughs> now how does that fit with our goals that we've set yeah yeah and, yeah, be yeah, like, and I'm like yeah. don't bring that negativity yeah, into my yeah, life yeah. I'm, I'm like <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> yeah well right it's like you said like going back to that toddler oh all right I'll I eat my it's veggies like, oh. first <laughs> I will say now what I've started doing is I say this hi I so I hold the idea back for a while mm -hmm. and I will go so before I start doing this I realize this is not going to be something we can do in the next six months but I need to tell you what I want to do because I believe this is where we're heading and yeah. I have worked out I'm normally between 12 to 24 months ahead of Rod in terms of where our business is going in terms of what happens yeah but introducing it to him then he often is like oh I can't see it but then he starts to see changes or things and he helps me get there and I yeah. do think I've had to learn to change, but I know he's also changed. And I think yeah. that is that key, isn't it? Yeah. And that's exactly right. And I would say there's actually a step before that key, mm. and that is awareness. Mm. So, you know, I can remember the moment I realized I was dyslexic and that, and it sounds a bit dramatic, but it really did change my life because oh, yeah. um, I was in the wrong restaurant completely I was supposed to be meeting I was training to be a Davis dyslexia facilitator and I was actually in the wrong restaurant so everybody <laughs> had agreed at lunchtime where we were going to go and I went off into my visual mind thinking oh I'm going to wear this and I know where that restaurant is and Vanessa you have to be on time you have to be on time you really need to impress these people be on time yeah that's what mm. I was thinking mm. I walked into the restaurant 20 minutes late because I was never on time <laughs> And there was nobody there. And I'll never forget it. And I was like, but I visualized this restaurant in my mm. mind. Yeah. And um, I went to the waiter and I was like, oh, have you got a booking for 15 people? And he's like, no. And at that moment, I thought, oh, my God, I'm in the wrong restaurant. And then something really amazing happened. I thought, but I know why I'm in the wrong restaurant. I think I might be dyslexic because oh, I was amazing. I was picturing the restaurant mm -hmm. I was in was what I was picturing when the instructions were being given to me. So I didn't actually hear them correctly. The sound was going in my ears. I love it. Yeah, but my I brain was visualizing that. And then instead of going, oh my God, I'm so stupid. How could I do this? How am I going to face them tomorrow? Like I just would have gone into so much negative self-talk. I understood why I'd got it wrong. And I think that's huge. When you have the awareness, mm. then you have the acceptance. And that's actually when you can start to change. Because, because you can't change what you don't know. Because I do think too, like I'm just, I realized like I had to go through this grief um, of a couple of things that I had to really go through was like a reset or a reframing. I, I not reframing of a whole lot of stuff that had happened in my past where yeah. either I had got deeply hurt by someone and I had no idea what I'd done. And then I could yeah. look back and go, oh, oversharing much, Rachel. Um, or, yeah. you know, whatever the thing was. And and going, oh, I'm not like a horrible, nasty, toxic person. Or I'm not this really, you know, I, I'm not this or I'm not that. Or I'm not lazy. Actually, I was just doing the thing that my brain was naturally geared to. And I just yeah. didn't know it wasn't appropriate in that situation. 
Ex exactly right. And I would say this is true of both dyslexics and people with ADHD, um, is we can be brutally blunt. Oh, and so blunt. One of, one of my sayings is, this is probably going to come out wrong, but blah, 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 <laughs> you know? And I'm, I'm like you, you know, it, it was a, an ability to look back and go, oh my God, I just thought I was so unreliable. Mm -hmm. That's how I used to feel. And it, that used to be devastating because I wasn't unreliable, but then I do all these really stupid things. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it gave me an ability to really look back and think, like I said, there was a reason, you know, yeah. and what I would say, you know, for anybody who's in business, who's, um, dyslexic or neurodiverse or ADHD is you kind of need to understand yourself and you need to understand your own strengths and weaknesses mm -hmm. and then you do I truly believe the most successful people will have that person beside them yeah and you know and whether that's a Rod or a Becky or whoever or a VA or someone who can just have I think there's and it, I'm not saying because I mean one of the questions I was going to ask you which I'll ask you in a minute is around whether you think it's a disability or not because this is a bone of contention in our house because mm -hmm. like, you know I've got children with autism and mm -hmm. also um, you know other things within the extended family and we have a conversation about this quite a bit but I think that, and of course, I did that whole thing, and now I'm like, what was I saying? Um, but I think with um, that idea is I realize I do need an external accountability, and that's not because I'm a baby, and it's not because I'm useless. It's just because that's how my brain best operates, yeah. and it feels like a, it didn't feel like I was loser. I didn't feel like I was a loser when I realized it was actually just a need. Yeah. And I think that's a beautiful way of saying it. It's a need. Mm. You know, what I would say is, and I love that you've brought up disability because it is a real bone of contention, right? So in what my, do you think about that? Do you think uh, it's a disability? Absolutely not. No okay. way. That's interesting, eh? Because my daughter who's autistic says it definitely is. Yeah. But this is what I would say. Um, I'm okay with it being labeled as a disability if it then allows things to change. I, like I don't believe it is, I don't feel disabled. Mm. What I would say is as a society and a world, we have learned to value left-brained success. I like education, that. Yeah, mm. um, success in your career, you know, um, Tidy, time, tidy being, cupboards. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Having tidy cupboards, being on time. You know. Yeah, being on time. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so we have all these unconscious biases that we have been shown. This is what success looks like. And to be successful, you've got to be A, B, C, D. Mm. Now, we're not disabled, but we can't achieve those naturally. So yes. it's almost like we need our own kind of like, what, what is success? How about if success was, you have really creative ideas, you're very empathetic, you can read someone, mm. and this is something, this is a skill a lot of um, neurodiverse individuals have, you can read someone, mm. you know, you connect with them instantly, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. You know? I, and you can spot if someone else is neurodiverse, and you, you, I've learned to spot them now because yeah. it's like a deeper connection, you're, you're best mates within about 35 seconds. Exactly. And that is a talent and a skill. But yes, it is true. It isn't one that is measured by our society. So what I would say is I don't feel disabled. What I would say is our way of looking at success is, is like this. And what we need to do is open it up. And I think the difference for us is, would you expect someone in a wheelchair to walk up three flights of stairs? Well, no, I, and I guess I guess that goes so, down to that thing is differently abled as opposed to disabled. Exactly. So you wouldn't expect them to do that, would you? No. Do you no. think less of them if they use the lift to go up there? I absolutely not. I, and I no. agree. That is it, isn't it? Because we do expect that our, we feel like we should be make, hammering our brains into some sort of subjection. Yes. And the only difference between, you know, um, a physical disability and one that you can't see is you can't see by looking at, at, at you or me that we are ADHD, dyslexic, whatever we've got going on, because we look the same from the outside. 
So That's yeah, huge. did that um, answer your question? <laughs> yeah, it does. And I think like I prepared for this um, because it's one of those, it's something I'm deeply interested in. Mm. And I, I was reading that it's, it said something that up between 30 to 40% of people are, are potentially neurodiverse, which is really mm. huge. Yeah. Um, and I know that you mainly work with corporates and organizations and individuals within that. Mm -hmm. And in terms of like small business or those organizations, um, if you are a neurodiverse manager or leader or business owner, what can you do to help your team or the people around you understand more yeah. about your brain? Yeah. And, and I really love that you're bringing this up um, because we've actually just finished a presentation with one of the big banks here in oh, New Zealand. Oh, exciting. Um, yeah, very exciting. Just talking about... Um, but raising awareness is the first thing. So mm -hmm. we actually had a whole lot of spelling mistakes all throughout our presentation. And um, we kind of, you know, about three quarters of the way through, we're like, okay, so who's noticed our spelling mistakes? You know, and a couple of people like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it was like, what did you think? And it was quite interesting. They were like, oh, well, you know, they did judge us mm -hmm. because that's what we're trained to do. So mm -hmm. I would say if you're a small business owner, if you're an organization, you know, there are some things that you can do to really raise awareness around neurodiversity. And, um, you know, we've got some free um, handouts and things that, that I, if this is a link. So now here. Yeah, can, I can put a link in. I just have a link. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't yeah, know yeah. where that's going. It's okay. Going. It's the show um, notes and I'll put a link in there. Yeah. Free stuff but I think, good. you know, one of the biggest things that I, in the adults I work with is it's that shame and embarrassment mm -hmm. um, of trying to hide the fact that they are struggling at work. And, you know, I look back to my um, career when I was in the corporate office, I was in HR and I was obviously some definite skills there, but, you know, getting reports in on time, it would take me hours longer than anybody oh, else. Me hours, too. Me you know? Too. And yeah. I was always working to like seven o'clock at night. Yeah. Um, and I think it's looking behind the behavior. So if there is some behaviors going on, it's looking behind that and, and there may actually be a reason for it. The other thing is your colleague might not know because mm -hmm. a lot of adults are getting diagnosed now. So what I would say is it's genetic. So about 60 mm. to 70% of neurodiversity is genetic. So a lot of people are getting their children diagnosed. And, and that was my journey. That's my, my son, journey. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. And then you're like, ah, oh, hang on. Ah. Oh, oh. And then I'm and like, now, hey, mum, mum. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And now I look at my parents and yeah. my mum is so ADD. It's unbelievable. So I think looking at the behavior behind what's going on. Mm. And, you know, we are so passionate about, I mean, I'm so glad you brought this up because we are so passionate about supporting these individuals out there and organizations as well. And, you know, we, we run some stuff on an app um, that is going to be a four, four part neurodiversity boot camp, oh, which awesome. is your first step in finding out about neurodiversity. Because even me, I didn't think I was dyslexic because I can read and spell. Yeah. yeah. You know, and it is, I guess it is that thing that, you know, those those preconceptions, like I know that when I first talked to my parents about me possibly having ADHD, um, my dad said, well, no, you're just lazy. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, which, you know, um, because I was totally like a goofball, like in terms of practical life, you know, he I, he's a veterinarian. He'd defy me as a veterinarian because I'd go and clean up the surgical room and I thought it would look perfectly great and there'd be swabs on the floor because I just didn't see them because my brain was somewhere else, you know, like, but yeah. good on reception. I was great on reception. Yeah, yeah. And, and like, and all that. And then with my, with my mum, she's like, but you weren't hyper you weren't yeah that and so this is understanding of what it is or it isn't or even you know with you know I've got a couple of close family members who are both autistic but they are completely different in the way that yeah. they present their autism there's yeah. a couple of things in common but even the way they do those things is different exactly and I think you know it's about what are the small changes that mm. you can make they're going to make a big difference and, you know, this happened to me the other day because this amazing person who we're doing some marketing work with, you know, I, needed oh, to buy, <laughs> I needed to buy a chicken costume. Now oh, that's yeah. a whole other podcast. But anyway, so I was on this website trying, <laughs> trying to order it. And 
it kept wanting me to message. And I'm like, I don't want to message. I want to speak because the effort for me to try and work out what I'm trying to say, then text it, I would rather speak to someone. Mm. And so it's little things like that is we use Loom. So I don't know if you've yes, heard we of use it too. We I use it use it. I have to use tired. Loom to talk because I get too tired to write it all down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but if you know as an organization or as a small business that actually it's easier for you just record a video, say what you need to say and send it, because not only is it easier for a neurodiverse person often to speak their thoughts, they also then don't have to read through an email mm. and miss things. So yeah. it's about some quick little wins like that, you know, and it really is just understanding that visual communication is the key for neurodiverse individuals. So we will remember stories, we'll remember events, but we will not remember the detail. You know? Or the date, or the date of the event. <laughs> hey, um, is yeah. there other are there other tools like I know one of the ones that I had started using when I first found out that I might have ADHD um, I learned this tool called shadowing and so I actually pay my admin assistant who happens to be my daughter Rebecca mm -hmm. I pay her a couple of hours a week to sit at the same table as me on my admin day because yeah. I hate ad admin people yeah. understand you'll understand but like I one admin task can paralyze me for an entire day even if it's a five minute task mm -hmm. and yep. I can't do anything until it's done, but yep. I also can't do the task. Yep. But if I pay her and I say, you have to sit here and I know I'm paying her and it's two hours, I can get all my week's admin done in that time yeah. because I've got her next to me shadowing me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Are there other task tools that you use that help you? Oh, um, I use, um, we created something called a target tool because... Ooh. Um, mm, and what that is, is it's just a way, because often what we do, right, is we all sit down and kind of write everything I've got to do. Yeah, yes, me I'll too. sit down and write it all down. The big and list. Forget yeah. about it. Yes. Because I've written it down. So what that means is I've got it out of my head. Exactly. <laughs> I don't need to do it now. No. So, but then it's actually then just knowing, okay, there is actually one step on from that. Mm. And you know, what happens with our beautiful brains is we see everything all at once that needs to be done. Mm. We don't know which is first. And that's when we go into that overwhelm and we go into paralysis, as you've yes. said, or we go into avoidance. So you'll find me going and putting the washing on or, you know, or off looking online or something, just doing anything other than yes. what I'm supposed to be doing. Sounds right? familiar. <laughs> yeah. So the, the target tool we developed was just a way of using a visual kind of bullseye. And then, you know, with a couple of questions, you just put one thing in the middle. So then when I start getting overwhelmed, I'm like, what's my one thing in the middle? And, uh, you know, another thing that's really changed the business for Becky and I, because Becky and I had been friends for a very long time. And you should interview her about what I used to be like. <laughs> you know? I mean, I can remember she'd be sitting in cafes waiting like 45 minutes for me, you know. Oh, wow. That um, used to really run late. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And she used to find that disrespectful. So I can understand that. Upset, yeah. yeah. And I'd be getting upset because I wasn't being disrespectful and I'd feel so upset that I'd like kept her waiting um and then when we kind of started finding all this stuff out you know she she's adapted and I've adapted mm -hmm. kind of like you were talking about you and Rod and one thing that we do now is we choose three things that we're going to focus on and that gives me the ability to ping between things because yes. yeah I it's think. that I'm the same try and, yeah. try and get me focused on one thing is too painful it's like it's like trying to put an octopus in a spring in a string bag. I love that. I love I use that illusion too. I agree. I think that yeah, if you're trying to stay on one thing, it's it's actually tiring for the brain. Because mm -hmm. your brain needs to be going and having a little rest breaks on something else to bounce back to that one yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. 
So it's there are some kind of some different techniques and tools. And what I would say though is different things work for different people, right? Yeah. So again, that brain thing, right? It is. It is. It's like I know some neurodiverse people who love Trello. You know? Oh and, no, I can't do it. Yeah, and I can't either. Yeah. And we've we've tried using it for our CRM, and bless Becky spends all this time setting it up. And then I open it and I look at it and I go, that's really good. Then I close it and then I don't think about it again. <laughs> so we have, I'll just tell you how we use, we use Zoho Connect, which is quite similar to Trello. And the way we've managed this is the rest of the team has to use it and they all use it. Um, and then we have a weekly WIP meeting on a Monday and Rod goes and closes all my, my tasks off for me during that WIP. Yeah. So I love it all being laid out and I need to be able to see it all laid out and I need to yeah. make sure that everything's doing the way they are. But to request, require me to do that or update the CRM, I feel sometimes bad because I'm like, he's not my secretary. He's my husband and my business partner. But actually I need him to help me function in that way. And he needs it to make the business function. So he's just quite happy to take it. So what I would say mm. is that is the lift that we were just talking about. Yeah, I like that. So don't feel that makes me feel better about that because it is. It's like the lift. It's just saying this it's is how the, you're doing this bit. It's just the lift, yeah. right? And I think you know it, it sounds a bit naff, but awareness is so huge because yeah, I, I think, think so. awareness is is really the key, whether it's for an individual in your family or for within a business. Mm. You know, um, it's you know Becky knows, bless her, and I came up with a little name for her that she's really not going to like. But here's my ADHD brain. <laughs> Does she, she know about this name yet? Oh, she hasn't heard it yet, Becky. I'm sorry. I won't title the podcast the name. No. So <laughs> okay. So I've kind of told you that I am the ideas person, and yes. I have this alter ego called the Disco Chicken. I love the Disco Chicken. I'm like this with ideas they're all like woohoo you know and often I will I'll be sitting there and I'll go oh 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 oh, oh I've got an idea yeah mm. so Becky is Saint Sponge oh because she just absorbs it all she takes it she yeah. doesn't hold on to it but she also doesn't um kind of go oh god we haven't got time for that or yeah, you know like yeah. she she honestly is a saint for working with me um, but it's because we know each other's strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And the only reason we know that is because of the awareness. Mm -hmm. And I know what her strengths are. And I actually don't mind that she is the one I've handed my diary over to her because, oh, my God, I was just a nightmare. I was always double booking myself. And I mean, ah, oh, it was just horrendous. I've been banned from making appointments. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Now, is Becky my secretary? Absolutely not. No, yeah, She's exactly. Equal. But that's that lift thing. Yeah, yeah? got it. I me doing it. it isn't going to benefit the business I kind of feel like we've gone off on a complete tangent now no, so that's a good question. I think that's the sort of stuff that I think is really important because I do think that if you are neurodiverse this is the stuff where you go what's wrong with me I just need to learn to do it myself and some of these things like I always think you know I often talk to people and say look you know, when it comes to running, I'm a heifer lump. When it comes to marketing, I'm a gazelle. Yeah. When it comes to admin tasks or remembering to pick up my daughter's iron tablets or whatever the thing yeah. is, I am a parenting heifer lump or I'm, yeah. I'm a, you know, a um, admin heifer lump. I'm never going to be a gazelle no matter how much I try to do it. Yeah. So I can work as hard as I can on it and I will continue to do that but I need someone else to be the gazelle for me. Yeah. And I think, you know, you've really hit something on here and, and this is something that we see a lot. So we run um, a couple of Facebook groups for adult dyslexics and we, Becky and I developed a course last year because we are so, um, so I'm just, there's my dyslexia, yeah. Ooh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we hear so many stories of people where they're ashamed of themselves. Mm. You know, they are masking, they're pretending, they are so stressed trying to keep up whatever facade it is, whether it's at work, at home, at school. It's exhausting. It's tiring trying to be normal. It is. It is. And then when you don't understand why you're not normal. Yeah. You know? And and I love Renee Brown's work around being psychologically safe. 
Mm. And really to do that, you need to accept yourself and then you kind of need to feel accepted. And I just, I think there's so much we can do as individuals to just start accepting yourself, you mm. know, and, um, and then organizations start accepting those quirky, different ideas, people, because so here's an interesting thing. Here's one of the theories out there is that neurodiversity is actually a genetic strength because otherwise it would have been bred out of us. Oh, I quite like that idea. <laughs> and it's absolutely well, true. We need it, right? And we probably need artists and creatives and those divergent thinkers more today than ever. But yeah. So, you know, and I think probably also, I think that probably the internet's probably increasing that neurodivergent space because people that can cope with it or cope with the changes most are probably people who can think those 35 yeah. frames a second, which makes yeah, sense, right? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, it's it's been quite interesting because even for me, you know, as I've said, I was in the corporate space mm -hmm. a long time ago. And then we went overseas and I was a stay-at-home mum for 15 years. Um, did a few businesses along the way, like I said, being ADHD as I am. Um, even for me now, talking to corporates, it took probably about a good 18 months for me to feel comfortable to stand in front of them and say, do you know what, I'm not a qualified psychologist and I am not a qualified neurologist. I am a qualified um, ADHD and dyslexia and autism facilitator, but I'm an adult with neurodiversity. I've got a, two neurodiverse children. I can really talk to you about what is actually going on. And it isn't a medical checklist of, you know, you'll see this, you'll see mm. that. It's like, this is how your employee is feeling. Yeah. And this is what you can do to bring out the best in them and, and bring out the best in yourselves. Because that really, you know, I'm, I, when I realized why I was in that wrong restaurant in that earlier story, I'll never forget it because I just sat down and ate some sushi. I love and, it. Yeah, and I didn't go into this, you're so useless, how are you going to face them? What are they going to think? I mean, obviously, old me, I probably would have not gone back to the training because I would have been so embarrassed. Yeah. I went in the next day and went, I think I've just found out I'm dyslexic. <laughs> <laughs> um, so once you know what your strengths and weaknesses are, then you can put things in place around you. And whether that be that shadowing person, yeah. you know, whether that be a um, loom video, whether that, whatever that is, there's nothing better than empowering a neurodiverse individual to actually go in and say, do you know what? I'm dyslexic. I can't, I can't do it that way. I'm going to have to do it this way. Yeah, it, it, I think like for me, I think one of the other things I realized, and it's really interesting that you're talking around some of those strategies, because I can go, yeah, those ones, I can see how they work for me or others I know. I think for me, one of the things I really learned was that I can't, if it's out of my structure or common things that I do, it might not be a great idea to say yes to it unless I'm also recognizing it's going to take me a long time to adapt to a different way of doing it. Yeah. And, and I, that surprised me because I had this idea that neurodiverse was, and especially with ADHD, is creative and we can do this, we can do that. But actually, I function very, very solidly on, on structure. So like, you know, that when we work together, I was like, you have the 9.30 to the 9 to 12 slot or the 1 to 4 slot. And it's on these days of the week. And it's simply because the more structure I have, the more I'm able to manage yeah. my environment. Yeah. And I think you brought up something really good um, in that point is I would say we are at either extreme. So that's okay? fascinating, right? Yeah, because I'm the same. I, I need structure to almost kind of give me that guideline because yeah. without it, I'm just like all over the place. Mm -hmm. But I kind of hate structure as well. Oh, I hate you know? it as well. So I, hate, I, I just know, know I need it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I'm not capable of giving that structure to myself mm. just because of the way my brain works. Yeah. So what you tend to find is you tend to find all neurodiverse people are in the kind of very edges. Yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. And like I said, yes, I am really creative, mm. but oh my gosh, I really need, um, I hate things being messy around me. Yeah. 
Yes. Because for me, I my brain is so chaotic. If there's chaos around me, I can't cope with that. My son is the complete opposite. You know, he's dyslexic and he loves the chaos. I love the so, chaos. Yeah. And when and again, I don't, but yeah. I, I can function very well in a mess that I have made. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not a mess someone else has made, but a mess that I have made. Exactly. And I guess all it is is, is it's you are not A or B. Yes, I love that. Okay. Some days yeah. you'll be A and yeah. some days you'll be B. And some days you'll be C to P, you know, like Yeah, it just and, doesn't fit. It's different. Yeah. Um, and one thing I was going to ask you about, because I do think, I don't know if this is a, dys, a dyslexic thing, but I know it's definitely an ADHD thing. And I, I know, by the way, if you're autistic and listen to this, I feel like I've abandoned you a bit. I don't mean to. It's just, it's such a big space. Yeah. Um, we could do another one on um, We could do another one on autistic. Yeah, that would be really good. Um, but I think one of the ones that I feel is probably one that I see a lot of business owners apologize and a lot of people in the corporate space is that interrupting thing <laughs> and yeah. we've been pretty good to be honest we yeah. have <laughs> we've been on our best behavior and I've started we have and I do actually normally at the beginning of a podcast I did it with you because then you'll be okay I do actually say hey I'm just thing you know I have ADHD so I do interrupt people so mm. please don't be offended and it's just because I'm excited and I can see where I need to take mm. the, the podcast mm. but but what it, with, with interrupting, like my personal opinion, and you might disagree with me, is while I should monitor my interrupting a little bit, sometimes it's just necessary. <laughs> so what I would say yes. is if you think how fast your brain is going, mm -hmm. the reason we interrupt is we have to get that thought out before it's gone. I know. I have pen and paper. That's helped me a lot. Yeah, and but what I would say is draw. Okay. It doesn't have to be words. Yeah. So and I think it's it's see once again, this is knowing, knowing why you're doing it. So sometimes in our weekly meetings, I sit there like that. Oh, because you just want to just not talk. Because <laughs> I'm like, I can't interrupt, mm. you know. But because we are in a team who we all know each other and we know our different strengths. We are also like, okay, just quickly interrupt and then you kind of go back. But I have learned to draw a little picture. Yeah. And it's, I'm, yeah. I'm talking about stick figures. I'm not talking about a massive art thing. No, I, I, and it's really interesting because I have a, a whole lot of my books from school when I didn't have any idea that I might have ADHD or anything. Yeah. Um, and every single piece of paper in those books have a chain of flowers all the way along. And then there's just flowers upon flowers. And I just used to draw them all the way through class. Yeah. And it was only in the classes that I did well in that I did that in. And I think there must have been a thing where it was relaxed in my brain. Um, and it's an interesting thing because when I was a teacher, I, you know, there was this whole thing around, hey, if people are just drawing while they're talking to you, they're not paying attention. And mm -hmm. I never allowed that. I always said in my classrooms, you can draw if you need to. And I look at that now and I go, thank goodness I did that. Yeah. Because I wonder if, you know, like quite often people say, oh, I saw you taking really good notes. Can I take, can I have them? And you're like, I'm sorry. It's just a whole bunch of weird flowers and cute. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or spiral. Yeah. Mine's the favorite is the amoebas. I draw a lot of amoebas. Oh yeah. But, you know, like I think, that would be a thing that if you're talking about like in a team environment or in a corporate environment, allowing people to have permission to have a pen and paper during a meeting and not necessarily take notes is actually okay. Yeah. And, you know, that, that kind of goes back into that. Why do we think that just because someone isn't looking us in the eye, mm. that they're listening? Yeah. They can be listening and doodling at the same time. It's just our expectation is that very left brain thing, mm -hmm. you know? And what I would say is, and, and this is a lot of what I do in the Davis work, is there is a huge link between creativity and learning. For anybody with ADHD, dyslexia, autism, you know, that that actual function mm. of, drawing, of drawing, I mean, there's, yeah. there's quite a lot in there, but anyway, I'll just yeah. do a top level. One for an ADHD, you're kind of keeping a movement going. Yes. Okay. So, so you're I'm focused. able to stay still and shut my mouth. Yep. So yes. you're focusing. Exactly right. So that's one part of it. The second is you'll be activating the creative learning centers in your brain, which is the way that you naturally learn. 
So by doing that, you know, you're engaging your learning style. So we have just have this belief that you have to rote learn by writing things out, yeah? And it doesn't need to be like that at all. Um, so it's just accepting that difference. And like you said, maybe sitting in a meeting and doodling is actually okay. Mm -hmm. Because that person isn't looking at you doesn't mean they're not listening. So, and that's the type of awareness that we want to bring into the, to the corporate space. Um, you know, some people need a quiet environment to work in. Some people need a noisy environment to work in. You know, there's all sorts of different things that you can do that are quite quick and easy that will help individuals, whether you're a massive organization or not. Because I know that one of the things I had to get over, um, so we've got a couple of people on our team who are neurodiverse alongside mm. me. One of them likes to watch YouTube videos while they're working. And mm. I was like, that's not working if you're watching a YouTube video. But literally, if she has a YouTube video, she's working. Yeah. If it's not on for some reason, she's not focused. And it seems yeah. so counterintuitive. But I'm wondering if it, this that keeps part of her brain busy so her brain can slow enough to do the task in front of her. Could be. Could be. I don't know. And, you know, and I would say yes, mm. or it's kind of keeping her in what she's doing, you know, because mm -hmm. there is that visual stuff happening. You know, I think, and I'm just going to quickly touch on this because, you know, you said earlier when you told your um, parents that yes. you, know, you think you had ADHD and they were like, but you weren't hyperactive. Yes. So what I would say is, you know, once again, that's thinking every dyslexic person can't spell. Yes. Every person with ADHD is naughty or mm. whatever. Um, you know, my way of coping with my ADHD in school was to be the helpful person. Oh, so yes. I'll, I'll help you. Oh, I'll go and get that. Do you know what I mean? I'll do that. Um, I was never naughty, but I also used to sit in meetings and do this. Oh, yeah, the flicking of the pen. Yep. Oh, yes. Constantly, you know, fidgeting, <laughs> you know, and, and definitely think, fidgeting. Yeah, you know, now these are all signs. Now, one of them on their own doesn't mean you're ADHD, right? And no. we could do a whole other podcast about personality versus neurodiversity, but anyway. But when you have a few of them together, and what I would say is they're causing you problems in your life. Yeah, yeah. Then there could be a reason. And um, yeah, anyway. I love <laughs> I it. Like no, we honestly could do this for hours. We're both, it's both like a hyper-focused interest area for us. So, you know, it's, it's dangerous. But I do know that you have other things to do today. Um, Vanessa, if people want to get hold of you or want to work with you, I know you work with individuals. So like you do have a program for dyslexics that they can do, uh -huh. which would be great for small business owners who know they're dyslexic. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and that's an online program and has a bit of support from you too. And then yeah. you have the Davis program, which is a very structured program that you can do that's one-on-one -on -one. Yes. Um, but if people are wanting to get hold of you to maybe come and talk to them maybe either yeah. as a business owner who has a team or yeah. have people in their business in their business who are neurodiverse and how to work how do they get hold of you so the best way is um, through our website which yes. is um, remarkableminds.org um, great name yeah, thank you. You're welcome to send me an email. Um, we are actually just about to launch some um, two and a half hour workshops Ooh. for corporates. And we're doing one on communication. So that's there's going to be an awareness piece. Um, then we're doing a communication workshop. So how to communicate with neurodiverse individuals in your team. We're doing one on the stress and anxiety for those. Oh, that would be really good. Yeah. yeah. Come and into. Yeah, it, and it is. And I think that's one of the real hidden sides of neurodiversity, apart from the being late and interrupting and not reading. It's actually the stress that an individual feels. And it was funny, you know, when you sent me the questionnaire last yeah. night, I had that. I was like, uh... that's why I CC'd in Becky. I know, I know, I know, I know. But, it, but I just, it was just interesting because, you know, um, it still happens, yeah? You yes. put a neurodiverse yep. person on the spot and they will go blank. I'm like that if someone sends me a calendar invite, like I'm quite happy to send someone else an invite, but as soon as they're asking me to commit to a time, I get very anxious because I'm like, yeah. 
What if it doesn't go on my calendar? What if I don't turn up? What if I'm a flag? What if I forget? What if I forget? And it becomes, what if I already have something then? I've got to go back to my calendar and check. And that takes me such a long time that I often don't book it. Exactly. And how much energy and thought had to go into that? So So, much energy and thought. (laughs) Exactly. And the third workshop we're going to do is around time management and organization. So great. What I would like to say is, as you were just saying, the time and energy and thought that went into that, Mm. that's why we start avoiding tasks. So we're not lazy. Mm. You're not lazy. It's just you've spent so much mental and emotional energy on a calendar invite that actually the thought of then, I don't know, cooking dinner or doing whatever you're supposed to do, you just can't. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, that's another thing. So you're not lazy. <laughs> no, and I, I have, I've actually realized that I'm not lazy. I actually, when I realized that my first step back to my dad was, um, I wrote 27 books in six years as a single parent of three preschool children and worked full time. I'm pretty sure I'm not lazy. Like it was just this light went off in my, in my brain and I was like, oh no, that's not, I'm not owning that. But it made me go, I can see how he'd think that because I couldn't keep my room tidy. I was always flaky about turning up to things, you know, because I've forgotten to write them down. So I can understand it. I could understand it, but I definitely didn't own it. And that moment I was like, no, I'm not taking that on. And it was really powerful. Um, This has been amazing, Vanessa. I do suspect we'll have to have you back on. I would love to talk to you about autism in terms of being a business owner with autism because I don't really know a lot about that. I have, you know, obviously family members who are autistic and I would Mm -hmm. be fascinated by it. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, I agree with you. It's just the same with any other neurodiverse person it's there's so many differences and often there's like I guess they call them a comorbidity which is a horrible name to say because it's like dead yeah um but like there are often things where you're ADHD and autistic or like you yeah. dyslexia dyslexic and auto, and ADHD and so it can be hard to kind of unravel that but I do think that would be a really interesting thing for us to talk about yeah I, I would love to and um the only other thing I'd like to add in there yes. is you know um and here you go here's me remembering facts and figures I'm pretty <laughs> sure that it's over 40 percent of all millionaires are dyslexic so wow yeah wow are you gonna take that one and claim that one absolutely absolutely <laughs> Um, so yeah, you know, is dyslexic, isn't he? Yeah, 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 yeah. He's dyslexic and a bit ADHD. Um, you know, there's uh, all I want to say. I guess my final parting yeah. comment is: uh, so I, we do um, ADHD programs as well as dyslexia programs. But and now I've forgotten my point. <laughs> are you gonna? Are you gonna say something about how we shouldn't we shouldn't limit ourselves? Yeah, you're right, actually. See, there's a beautiful ADHD interaction. Yeah. You kind of have that Because I think it would have been, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's it. You know, you don't have to be a Richard Branson no. to be successful. But being able to own your own talents and empower yourself is actually the biggest gift that you will give yourself and your business, whether you're an employee or an owner. And, you know, I just want you to remember that lift versus the stairs. If you're having someone shadowing you, it's not for any other reason than, than that's the lift. I love and it. Does it really matter yeah. how we get there, whether it's in the lift or up the stairs? Well, the lift's faster too. Exactly. <laughs> and we all love, we all love, we like this very fast. <laughs> oh, this has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Your details are in the show notes. Please, if you're an organization or a business mm. and you go, I need to have someone like Vanessa to help me make sense of my world or my team, get in touch with her. Um, Vanessa, thank you so much for being part of the show. Oh, you're welcome. It's an absolute pleasure, Rachel. Absolute pleasure. Sometimes I come out of the podcast recordings with my guests and I feel completely bathed in this beautiful, happy joy that I got to spend an hour or so talking to someone who I find completely engaging and I just would want to keep talking for ages to them about. In fact, it was very hard for me to press stop on the podcast and even harder to leave the conversation with Vanessa And I guess that comes down to that old ADHD attachment that comes with finding the people. And I think for me, um, out of everything that I heard today, the most important thing for me was to start seeing that 
if you are someone who has to do things differently, no matter what it is, it might not even be that you're neurodiverse. It could be something else. But there's such a weird thing in so many of us where we feel we've got to do it the same way as everyone else to be considered a good business owner or a good adult or a good person. But actually, it's okay if we find ways to cope with the areas that we're not so great at. After all, people who are neurotypical need people who are neurodiverse to come up with the creative ideas. I know that for me with Rod, I need him to be such a practical support to me in my life. But I also know he couldn't do the marketing that I do. He definitely couldn't dress up in a road cone costume. He couldn't do the same quirky things or see the world the same as I do. Neurotypical and neurodiverse people need each other. And as a business owner, if you are one or the other, having the other sort of brain in your life is going to make your business richer, it's going to make your life richer, and it's going to give you an opportunity to see things in a new way. If you are neurodiverse, I hope this helped you. I know I learned some stuff today, and I hope that it's also helped you start to see your brain in a new light. Thanks for joining in, and um, we'll catch you next week. If you love what you heard today, be sure to hit subscribe. And if you love this episode in particular, I'd love it if you shared it on social media. Remember to tag me in so I can say thank you. Have a great week, and we'll talk soon.